Hi everyone, hey, thanks so much for connecting with me today, whether you're coming on YouTube or Facebook, I appreciate it so much. Moms, I hope you all had a wonderful Mother's Day. I hope they spoiled you rotten. (laughs) And if they did, consequently, you might not have seen last week's message. And I just want to let you know, it's still up on Facebook, on mine, as well as Hillside's, or it's on my YouTube channel. If you want to find that, you can just go to hillsidecares.org. And under sermons, it says YouTube channel. You can go there and all of our messages are archived there. So uh, it was the fourth fourth message in our series called Say. And a lot of people mentioned that this was helpful to them. And um, I don't want you to miss out on that. That was a two-part series that turned into four. But (laughs) there was just so much great stuff I wanted to share that uh, I had that fourth message there for you. So I hope it's a help to you. Today, I've got a special treat for you. Jason Ward, who is a longtime friend, who is our drummer at church. I've done a lot of ministry with him. Um, He's done youth ministry and college ministry. I've been, you know, just taught the Bible. It's just, he's just a great guy. And he is going to be sharing the word with us today. Um, Last week we were gone because we were helping Janelle with our brand new granddaughter. And so uh, he filled in and did a great job. He's preaching on Psalm 19. Now, if you have a Bible, you'll want to grab that. And Psalms is in about the middle. So if you take the the Bible, you look at it, and you open it up in the middle, you'll be in Psalms and just find Psalms 19. Uh, You might get the Bible app. You version is the one I use. I love it so much. And you can just go to Psalm 19. You just type it right in there, and it's it's really easy. So, uh, and you can also find it online. But I know it's going to be a help to you, an encouragement to you. And so I'm really thankful for Jason sharing this message on Psalm 19. Hey, thanks so much again for joining me, and I'll talk to you at the end. So David uh, was sharing with us over the last few weeks some stuff about our words and our tongue and controlling the things that we say, and um, that, of course, is difficult. (laughs) Very, very difficult, you know, because there's there's layers to that. There's, you know, the layer of actually, like, guarding what comes out, and then there's the layer of... um, now actually having good things come out (laughs) not just not saying anything but actually saying good things so so that's kind of that second layer and then that third layer is um actually getting to the point where what's in your heart and wants to come out is the appropriate thing right and so there's there's these difficult layers that go along with that and um i was fortunate to uh grow up in church and so you know sunday school christian school um you know all You know, church, uh, midweek church, Awana, I mean, all this stuff. And so, as a child, I memorized a lot of verses, a lot of Bible verses. And sometimes I didn't appreciate having to do it at the time, especially since my mom had some special ones for me that uh, she would have me learn to kind of help me with some uh, deficient areas in my life. (laughs) And so, so I, I wouldn't always appreciate it, but I really do appreciate it now. You know, I come across people who have accepted Christ later in life and have these amazing testimonies, right, of how, you know, things were just, I mean, they they hit rock bottom and and God was there and they found him, you know, in that place where he found them probably more accurately. And, uh, you know, just these powerful testimonies. And and as somebody who grew up in church, you kind of get this tendency to be a little jealous, you know, like, well, I don't don't have that, you know, really super powerful. But then as as you talk to these newer believers, they go, well, you know, I'm kind of jealous of what you have. Because you've got all this foundation, you know, I've got a a friend who was saved, you know, just a few years back, and he would always say, man, I just feel like I'm playing catch up, like I'm so far behind, you know, and, and so I try to appreciate that as much as I can. And so anytime, you know, I'm listening to a message or whatever, you know, and we'll be talking about passages and and passages will always just be jumping in my mind, stuff I learned as a kid, you know, I. I didn't really keep up on it over the years like I probably should have, and so a lot of times I can't even remember the, the reference, you know, but, but you're like, oh, that verse, that verse is so cool, you know, and, and, and then, you know, I got to go look it up. I gotta, Technology is so nice now, isn't it? You just type it in the search and you, boom, there it comes, you know, and you're like, wow, very cool. So, you know, it used to be a lot more work with the whole concordance thing. Yeah, but anyway, um, one, of those, one of those verses that was really just stuck with me through this whole um, series that David just went through is, is in Psalm 119, um, and it says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. I thought, okay, that's like the end goal. You know, I was talking about like the three steps. <laughs> you know, the, okay, let's not say the bad things. Okay, let's try to say some good things. But let those be the things, Lord, the things that are pleasing to you be the things that I'm thinking about, the things I'm putting in, and the things that are coming out. So, as I was, you know, thinking about that verse, and that verse just kept 
kept on me, you know, I always love to take verses in context. So, you know, I go to Psalm 19, and, and God just kind of gives me this passage, and he just says, hey, I need you to hang out here for a while. And so, Psalm 19 is what I have been hanging out with over, you know, the last few weeks. And so, that's what we're going to talk about today, because that's what God's showing me. So, whether this is anything to do with you or not, sorry. It, it is God's word, so I'm sure he's going to speak to you in some way. But, but this, is, this is what we've been hanging out around lately. Um, one of the cool things about scripture to me is that um, scripture was written by a bunch of different people. And so you've got all these, all these people in scripture. And, and as you hang out in scripture, it's like you kind of get to know these people in a little bit of different ways. You know, you, you just know little bits about them. And then you can kind of maybe imagine some of the things that go with this stuff. You know, like uh, James and John, the, the sons of thunder, right? <laughs> And so you can kind of put pieces around that and you can kind of imagine, you know, what they must have been like to hang out with, you know. And then sometimes it's like people's style. Like I really love the book of James because I love his communication. He's just direct, you know. He doesn't, you know, dance around it. He just kind of says, hey, this is what it is. You know, I feel like he's a very efficient communicator and I appreciate that. Um, you know, and then you, you, you read John and John talks about feeling this incredible love from God to him, right? <laughs> he always refers to himself as the disciple who Jesus loved. That's an awesome way to refer to yourself, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, that'd be cool if you could really honestly feel that way about yourself in every moment, wouldn't it? You know? Um, and then there's the, the ones where God actually says little things about different people, like Moses was the most humble man who ever lived, right? You're like, whoa, there's a distinction for you. That's pretty cool. And Psalm 19 was written by David. And what, what does God say about David? What do we know about him? Okay, this mask thing really really cramps the, the communication here. But, but we know that David was a man after God's own heart. And I think, wow. That's the distinction that God threw out there for all of us to know about David. Is he's a man after God's own heart. And so if there's this guy out there who God says, hey, this is a guy after my own heart, might be a guy kind of worth checking into a little bit, right? Kind of going, okay, what's, what makes him tick? What makes his heart so much in tune with God? And Psalm, 9, Psalm 19 here kind of, kind of paints a little bit of a picture of David's heart for God. And, and I think this is something that for me anyway, it's been really helpful in um, almost like a roadmap to, a, to connection with God. So it starts out in verse 1. Well, it's to the choir master, right? David was a songwriter, harpist, we know that. Um, so he starts out in verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has sent, set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. It is rising, its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuits to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. So he starts this out by acknowledging the greatness of God, right? He talks about his creation. And he says, this creation, this, this world we live in, declares, cries out, shouts out how amazing our God is. Right? In other parts of the Bible it says, hey, if there's creation there, you don't have an excuse for not believing there's a God. Right? So, and he talks about the order of the creation in this here, too, right? He's talking about even just the sun, just the way the day works, right? And he uses all this, you know, poetic language, which makes you realize he spent a lot of time just thinking about the sun coming up and, and the time of the day and the sun going down and the order of this and, and how amazing it is that God put this in motion. He spent enough time thinking about this that he, he has these analogies and this, this beautiful poetry around just something that we don't even think about on a normal daily basis, right? Just the sun coming up and going down. But I think it's amazing that as he's sitting down and spending this time, he's concentrating and thinking about and focusing on the greatness of who God is, right? And that's where it all has to start. It has to start with 
a deep, real, true understanding that God is God. He is so far beyond. He is so powerful and amazing. That's where it has to start. Because what we're going to get into next doesn't really mean a whole lot until you truly understand and believe that. That you believe that God is so vast and so great and so amazing and He has put things in order and He is the creator of all, including us. And then we pick it up here in verse number 7 where it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Now, I don't know about you guys, but let me, let me throw a little scenario out there. Have you ever like been in a hurry to get somewhere and you're driving down the road and you happen to notice that this road for absolutely no apparent reason has a speed limit that's like 35 or something? Have you, have, have you ever run into that situation or has that only happened to me? And I gotta tell you, there are times like that where I'm not very fond of law. I don't feel like law is something that revives my soul, right? What I feel like is, I want to find whoever it was who decided that there should be a 35 mile an hour speed limit on this road, drag them down here by their ear, and ask them to show me why in the world there could possibly need to be a 35 mile an hour speed limit on this road. Well, guess what? When you understand that God is God, the creator of all, including you, you don't ever have to question, what was this idiot thinking when he made this law, right? It creates a whole different scenario, doesn't it? When you go, oh man, hey, I don't understand this, but the problem's got to be me because, <laughs> because the guy who knows everything does understand this. It does make sense to him. And that changes things dramatically. And it says that God's law revives our souls. Now, when does something need to be revived? Yeah. Yeah, when, when, it's, when it's dead or dying or in, in some serious, serious damage, right? It always makes me think of Princess Bride. He's only mostly dead. But, but that's, when, that's when something needs to be revived, right? And so David went through a lot of stuff in his life. And I can imagine him sitting here going through the whole wonderful pandemic with the rest of us, wearing his mask, wishing he could breathe. And, and I can imagine him thinking to himself, Man, my soul is just run down. <laughs> all, this, all this stuff going on around me is just wearing me down. And I'm burnt out. And I feel, like, I feel like I'm in a bad way here. And then he says, but the law of the Lord revives my soul. It brings life. It brings joy, goodness. Why is that? It's simple. It's because the real problem, the real thing that damages our soul is sin. Right? Sin's that thing bringing us down. You know, and we, we, we throw sin out there and it's this concept and, you know, I, I kind of like to think of it in kind of three parts. There's, there's the sins we commit, which are really just kind of like the fruit on the tree, right? It's the ultimate result of how that tree is growing, right? So there's the sins we commit and then there's the sin that we live in. And that's that thing that is the habits that indwell our bodies or in, in, in our, our person, right? We have these, these the sin that we, we live in. You know, that, that's kind of that area where a lot of these difficulties we have controlling the tongue comes from, right? <laughs> it's those habits, those responses that, you know, the way that that temper can rage up so quick in us or whatever it is, right? And then, and then at the very core of it all is there's just that sin nature that we all have. We were born with this rotten, ugly, just horrible sin nature. And we don't like to admit it. We don't like to think of ourselves that way. Everybody wants to think I'm a good person. But deep within you, at your core, you are a sinner. You have a selfish, ugly person inside there that you were born with, just like me. And so those things are what wears our soul down. But the law of the Lord revives our soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. What's a testimony? It's what somebody has to say about something, right? To me, I love that. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Because that means no matter what I think about a situation, 
All I got to do is look at what does God think about this situation? And I can know that there is a right answer. <laughs> I can know there is something there that sure God's perspective is always right. It is sure. All those times where you come across these horrible, hard decisions you have to make in your life. God's testimony is always sure. What he says about this is always sure. And it says making wise the simple. That's the other reason I like that. Because I'm the simple and I like to be wise. <laughs> so, so if I just choose God's way, because I can always be sure that that's right, I can live in a sense of wisdom that I don't possess if I try to rely on my own perspective and my own thoughts on what something is. The precepts of the Lord are right. Precepts is not a word we use a whole lot. So I actually looked it up in the dictionary. And it says, general rules intended to regulate behavior or thought. General rules intended to regulate behavior or thought. With my children, I try my best to, to parent in precepts rather than in rules. My daughter hates that. She would like me to tell her, yes, you can, or no, you can't. She does not like it when I sit there and I go through, well, let's look at what this is. Let's, what are the guiding principles that would maybe help us to make a smart choice in this situation, right? Those precepts, those principles, right? Those things that you can use to govern all of your way of doing life, right? Those overarching rules. Jesus broke it down into just, really just one that he split into two parts, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. That's the overarching precept that Jesus gave and said, hey, if you take this and apply it to everything else in your life, you're going to do okay. It's going to work out. You're going to make some good choices. Right? The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart, saving you from misery and struggle and heartache and all these things that come with us living a life that goes outside of the principles that he's laid out for us, right? The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes, right? Can't tell what to do? It's right here. Go back, find, find, what would Jesus do, right? The old bracelet thing, right? Enlightening the eyes, giving us light to see in the dark world, giving us a perspective, giving us the ability to understand and evaluate things that we couldn't otherwise. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and, the, and righteous altogether. The fear of the Lord is clean. The fear of the Lord is unblemished and is unfallible, right? And the fear of the Lord is the reverence of who the Lord is, right? That is something that is unchangeable. And when we have that reverence for the Lord and realize that it endures forever, it helps us as we deal with all these other things that it's talking about here. It goes on and says, the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. When God says, this is what's best for you, it's true. I don't know about you, but I have had times in my life where what God says is best for me is not what I think is best for me in that moment. I've had a lot of times like that. I've had a lot of times where I think, you know, common, common sense tells me I should do something else here. I've had times where my own desires tell me I should do something else here. I've had times where, you know, my own logic says I should do something else here. I've had times where my own sin nature, selfishness and whatnot, tells me I should do something else here. But there have been a lot of occasions where what God says I should do is not what I think is best for me. I'm going to give you one guess here. Who do you think is wrong? Right? Because the rules of the Lord are true and right. Always. And you know what? It's hard to accept that if you don't start with that understanding and that time sitting and 
just realizing that God is God and he is so vast and so much smarter than I am and he is so powerful and so amazing and he's the one who made me and he knows what is going to bring joy and fulfillment to my life even when I don't think it is and he goes on in verse 10 here he says more to be desired are they than gold even much fine gold sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb so what are the two things he's talking about here he's talking about wealth and appetite right <laughs> these are the things that we should desire more than any kind of wealth that's out there and more than any kind of desire that we might have an appetite for right he says God's word is better and it should be sought after more than these things. And I gotta say, I mean, what do you spend more time on each day in your life? Seeking God's word or worrying about your money or some passion or desire, right? That's convicting to me. What do I spend more time doing? Do, do, I, do I get more excited about spending time in God's Word? And do I hunger and desire that more than sitting down and watching my favorite team play ball? Unfortunately, maybe not all the time. Whatever it is, what, what is that thing that, that gets you excited? What is that thing that you make time for, that you carve out space for in your life. Man, I really enjoy this thing. I really want to do this thing. Or I really, really am, I gotta, I gotta get this money so I can be set for retirement. I gotta accumulate this and I gotta do, right? What, what are the things that your life is revolving around? What are these things that are controlling your time and your thoughts, right? The man after God's own heart says, God's word is that thing for me. Knowing all about God's commands and his laws and his rules and his precepts, his desires for my life, how I should live, how I should interact with people, what should I do? He says, that's more important to me than what I can get or what I can have or what kind of comfort or joy I might be able to bring myself in this moment. And when I say joy, I'm not talking about the true joy that comes from Christ. I'm talking about a temporary happiness of some sort. He says, moreover, by them, by these laws, decrees, rules, all these things, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. He says, these are the things that guard me from disaster <laughs> in my life. I'm not from disastrous circumstances all the time because there's other people making choices all around you that affect you too. But he goes on and he really starts to get personal with it right there, starting with, you know, your servant. And then he, he asks this question, who can discern his heirs? Who of us even knows all the, the sins and the stupidity that lives within us, right? Right? <laughs> I mean, someday we're going to get to heaven and have a greater understanding of some, some scriptures that maybe we thought we knew what they meant and probably find out that I, I was doing stuff wrong all along, you know? I mean, it's what he says, who, who can even know the things you're possibly screwing up, right? I mean, it's, it, it goes beyond our capability to even understand them all. But then he says, hey, Lord, please just declare me innocent from these unknown wrongs, right? The Bible says to him who knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it is sin, right? That's what he covers next. <laughs> he says, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Hmm. I don't know about you guys, but I unfortunately have that problem sometimes. <laughs> I'll look at it and I'll go, well, I know that's not what I should do right now. But I'm going to do it anyway. And so obviously David knew that he had that tendency too. Because he said, hey, help me Help me. He, he's asking this preemptively before this even happens. <laughs> he, he, he's going to God before he does this and he says, hey, keep me from these presumptuous sins. Right? Hey, don't let me go there, God. Pull me back. Rein me in. Help me. 
I'm not real good about doing this on my own. I need you. He says, let the not have dominion over me. You realize that, that sin, that deep sin sickness that we have, is kind of the only disease and sickness that, that we actually um, take part in, that we actually are part of acquiring, in a sense, right? It, it, it's really the only one that we give permission to, right? If somebody came around and said, hey, I got some COVID here, you want some? You're going to go, oh, no thanks, right? It doesn't mean you're not going to get COVID, but you're not going to invite that, are you? No. But sin is a sickness that we are we are culpable in, right? We, we say yes to. We invite this thing that eats away at our soul to come into our lives. And then it begins to take root and have dominion over us. And that's what he's talking about here. Hey, keep me from that. And don't let these things control me. Don't let these things ruin my life. Don't let these things corrupt my soul. Keep me from them. Because I know how harmful it's going to be. And I only know that because you've told me that. And I agree with you because you are God. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. And then it ends with that verse that I shared with you at the beginning. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now, for me, this has been something that God has kind of laid on me. Hey, get up with this each morning and walk yourself through this process. So each morning I get up and I spend time trying to just acknowledge and even in the slightest way comprehend the vastness and greatness of God, right? And just, just looking at all the amazing things that he's done around me, maybe the things that he's done in my life, I can look at those things and I can go, wow, God is amazing. You know, and when I do look at those personal things in my life, I can also say, hey, God is loving and God doesn't let me down. Things don't always go the way I want, but he's always there and he's always working in that on my behalf. Right? So we start there with just taking that time to recognize that God is God. I'm not. And so I need to take a step back and I need to see, okay, God, what is it that you have for me today? How do you want me to approach today? How do you want me to navigate today? As sometimes it ends up being, right? It's like you're going out into the minefield sometimes, how it feels like, you know, as you go through your day. And it, okay, God, I'm going to spend some time in your word now. And I'm not going to spend time in your word because it's an obligation. It's not because it's on my checklist and that's what I do in the morning. It's because I need it and because I am learning to love it and to, to seek it out, right? That's why I want to spend that time in your word, God. And, and I don't want to just spend time reading through this stuff and packing a little knowledge in. I want to spend time sitting there and saying, God, I want your word to affect me today. God, show me something today that is going to change the way I do my day. Something that I can use today. Show it to me. And maybe I don't even know what it is until that situation comes up in the day. But if you don't have God's word in you, you're not prepared when that situation comes up, are you? And then, of course, there's that confession. There. Sometimes as you dig into God's Word, things come up, right? <laughs> wow, God, uh, I haven't been doing that one real well. right? Well, God's loving and forgiving. And he's full of grace, right? New mercies every morning. And just say, I confess, right? God, I wasn't on the same page with you as this, and your page is the one I need to be on, right? And then, hey God, keep me from this stuff as I go through the day to day, right? Keep me from that presumptuous sin, as David calls it. Guard me from that. Protect me from that. I've, I've taken in your word as like a, a shield around me, in a sense, from those things, right? So that when those 
situations come up. I know what you would do in those situations. And then please, by the power of your spirit, help me to do that instead of what I want to do. Because I'm going to mess it all up. <laughs> if I go my way, right? And then let the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart be pleasing to you. Could you imagine that? Go through an entire day where not only the words of your mouth, I mean, that would be pretty amazing too, but the words of your mouth and the thoughts of your heart were pleasing to God all day long. Man, even when that guy cuts you off on the road. <laughs> got, some, got some head shaking on that one. <laughs> yeah. But, but I want to challenge you guys. I want to challenge you guys to... to to take this Psalm 19 pattern and use it each day this week. Do those things. Get up in the morning and acknowledge God, you're God, and I need you and your wisdom, and so I am going to joyfully dig into your word. Get a little bit of that truth that's going to make me not such an idiot today. And then help me, Lord, to go out and live that. And at the end of the day, I want to be able to come in and look back and go, wow, the words of my mouth and the thoughts, the meditations of my heart were things that were pleasing to God today. That'd be a nice way to go to bed at night, wouldn't it? <laughs> and I think you'd find that a lot of life would start to fall in place as well. Because God's ways are the ways that work. Father God, I just thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Um, I take it for granted too often, Lord, but I don't want to. Help us all, Lord, to be like David, where, um, Lord, we seek your word, we hunger for your word, we desire your word. Your word is more precious and valuable to us than anything that this world has to offer. Because we know, Lord, that when we, when we live that way, we can become, like David, people after your own heart. And Lord, we want to be that because you've loved us so much. You created us. You sent your Son to redeem us when we rejected you. You've given us your word to help us be able to live um, a life that is full of joy and peace. Full of uh, your prosperity, one that really matters. And so God, I just uh, I thank you for this time that we had to look in your word. I thank you that um, you were here with us, that your, your spirit was speaking to hearts, Lord, um, far better than any words that I could ever um, say. And uh, just uh, once again, I want to thank you for the mothers, Lord. Uh, what a gift it is that you have you, you created the order to be in that way. Um, and I'm thankful you know, for my mom and uh, what she's meant in my life. And the thing I'm most thankful for is, is Jesus. It's in his name, pray. Hey, thanks again for joining me today. And if there's anything I can do to be of help to you and encouragement to you, you have questions, uh, just need someone to talk to, uh, please feel free to message me and I'll be glad to connect with you in any way that feels comfortable to you. Hey, I want to just encourage you, next Sunday, we will be starting our series online called Drop the Mask. <laughs> and um, I know that... Uh, We'd all like to drop these physical masks for having to wear in the grocery store and everything, and can hardly wait for that to happen. But um, but some of us are carrying emotional masks, or we're we're wearing spiritual masks, we're wearing relational masks, and we 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 do that so that people don't see the real us, they don't see the real pain, the real difficulty that we're having, and that's what we're going to talk about. How do we drop those masks? God will help us, and I hope that you'll plan to join me for part one next Sunday. In the meantime, I hope this finds you well, and thanks so much for connecting today. God bless.